What actually is that white dust all over your extruder, print beds that are having a bad day, and a bamboo that has been giving a user just a little bit of problems. But I think the solution might be easier than we might think. All this and more Print Fix Friday, episode 121. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining us on the 121st week of Print Fix Friday. I got Victoria here with me, although she's going to go on a little bit of an expedition in just a little bit. I can feel it. But if you are new here, leave a like and get subscribed. And hey, if you are dealing with printer problems, we can help you out. It does not cost a dime to get help from experts here at 3D Musketeers. You can email us and you can even submit them to us on social media. Tag us or slide into those DMs. We'll do what we can to take a look and get you back to printing with purpose. And hey, all it costs is a little bit of your time and who knows, maybe you'll end up in these videos. We love helping you and that's part of what we do. We're going to be starting at some point soon, a live series where we're going to do call-ins where you can call and ask about a printer problem that you're having. We're still working on the ideas of it, but if you think that's really awesome, let me know how you envision it happening down below because uh might be fun kind of crowdsource this one and have a little bit of an interesting time, if you will, live right here on YouTube. Hey, let's jump right into fixing some fails with some support material. That's not having a great day. Supports have become super hard to remove. We've got uh, some issues and it says that it's described in the first comment. I've been printing fine for ages on my Ender 3 Pro, slicing with Cura and using tree supports. They've always worked really well. They've been super easy to pop off the print once finished. However, the last couple of prints I've done, the supports have been virtually impossible to remove, like they're fully welded on. I'm not aware that I've changed any of the slicer settings. Filament is eSun Red PLA Plus. I don't think I've printed anything with supports with this filament yet. Is it possible it's actually the filament that's the problem and not the slicer settings? The filament is properly dried. We got a lot of good information here. We got some print settings. Those look fine, but you were talking about tree supports and now we're looking at support pattern as zigzag. Interesting. I don't think I've ever seen tree do zigzag, but maybe it's overwritten. All of this looks okay. Yeah, I'm not really seeing any particular issues that I'm worried about. In a case like this, it is likely due to some form of cooling. No? All right, we're not gonna let me film this, apparently. Do you, do, oh, do you disagree? Do you disagree? In a case like this, it is likely due to cooling of some sort. If you're overheating the filament and it's not cooling fast enough, you're gonna run into an issue where the materials are physically welding to each other versus where, at least in this case, your support material is barely below your actual part, if your actual part is not being cooled enough, those two might be welding together more than you would be expecting. You can try to run a temp tower. We actually did an entire episode of Print Fix Friday all about temp towers. We'll card to it so you can take a look. Start there. If these are the same settings that you've used on other filament, then I am more likely to start blaming the filament than I am to blame anything else. If you try with a different type of filament that you have or a different color, assuming it's also PLA plus and it works just fine. Yeah, I can absolutely point my finger at material. However, it's not very common that we see specifically red filament require a lot of either extra heat or less heat than any of the other kind of regular colors. Black and white seem to be the only two that really require a little bit more fine tuning than the others in my personal experience. So in a case like this, if you can up your cooling, that might not be a bad move. Realistically, I would run a temp tower and just see what it looks like. PLA plus should run close to PLA temps, maybe an extra 5C more if you need it, but who knows? It could be something really weird. I don't think it's wet filament. I'm sure people will say it's wet filament. It is not experiencing any symptoms of being wet at all. But if you do have some sort of like special cooling duct, maybe it got pushed out of the way and it's not doing its job. Just verify that the cooling is going to where it needs to go as well. Hopefully that works well. We do have some like special support settings that seem to work pretty well for us, but that is Cura. And I don't know if my settings are going to properly translate. Hope that makes sense. I don't know what discord this was, but it was sent to us by a fan in our discord. We can see here that this person says, apparently the Creality K ones are starting to show 
New issues. Now, Mr. Nero 3D here is saying, did someone add an exclamation point to one of the Z motor configs? And the individual replies saying, remember, there's only one Z motor. This is a pretty easy thing. In fact, we have a few printers that work like this where there's multiple Z lead screws, but only one Z motor. If you don't have your belt tension set properly for that, and you don't have a lot of the belt itself actually touching the gears that it's driving, your belts are gonna slip. It's no big deal. Check to make sure that your belts are properly tensioned down there because if not, they are gonna, you know, skip around. But realistically, it could also be degrading the belt if it is too tight. There's this weird thing with printers that have these. You must have as much contact over the drive gear as you can. And we will see in printers that do it right, that they'll have some idlers to ensure that you get more coverage over that circular gear by the belt itself. So if this is your belt, you have your gear in the middle where the belt is driving on. If it is going to two other points, you only have this little bit here touching. But if you're able to add some sort of an idler pulley, you can get more contact patch, which means it is less likely to slip like we can see here. We can see that at least one of the sides is working, but yeah, they're all kind of just barely below each other. That's a weird one. I would check belt tension, check to make sure the belt is good. And then, and only then, would I check to make sure that the grub screws on everything are nice and tight and not slipping. While not impossible, it's a very uncommon thing since your build plate doesn't normally move very much. So it's not very common to see that the grub screws could back out. It's possible, but I'm guessing it's unlikely. Welp. That's new. And we've got a, what is likely an ender with one of those uh, dual gear red extruders with the filament broken right through the Bowden tube. We've talked about this before, and especially on machines where the Bowden tube is not just used for traversing filament, but is also part of the hot end. So in a ender style printer without an all metal hot end, the Bowden tube itself is a wear item and will need to be replaced at regular intervals. It looks like there is still some filament in the Bowden tube. So maybe it got jammed and then the filament snapped and then it just tore a hole through. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure of exactly if that tube is empty or not, but grinding a hole in your Bowden tube is a totally normal thing that will happen from time to time, especially if you have high extruder pressure. Because if you do have high extruder pressure, you're going to cut basically teeth into your filament, which is more abrasive than the smooth filament on its own and is more likely to wear holes in that Bowden tube. Thankfully, Bowden tube is cheap as chips and you can get it for really cheap online. If you are looking to get some of the good stuff, Cap tube or Capricorn tube makes some of the best Bowden tube out there. It does come with a premium cost. So some of you might just say, I'm gonna buy the cheap stuff and go bulk. And that's totally fine. Just understand the tolerances aren't going to be as good and you might see a little bit more backlash in your prints. With cap tube, it's a little bit tighter. I think it's often worth the money, especially on Bowden printers. If your printer is not Bowden and it's maybe using it as like a filament guide, eh, use the cheap stuff. It doesn't really matter. But if this is an integral part of your machine, there's no point to me in using the cheap stuff. I'd rather spend a little bit of extra money on the good stuff know that it's from a quality company and it's like putting full synthetic oil in your car. You don't have to do it, but it's probably better if you do. If the car is a thing that you rely on to get you places, why not take good care of it? What's all this white stuff on my extruder? No, no, it's not some of that booger sugar. This is the... <sighs> I'm sure there's a technical term that I don't know what it's called, but it's basically the fumes from printing. It's the stuff that comes off from superheating plastic. This is common. You see this all over printers. In fact, it normally just wipes right off with water. It is exacerbated by dust. A lot of times that off gas thing can be a little bit sticky and it can grab dust, which does sometimes look white. Any of you that own bamboo printers or fully enclosed printers that print a lot of ABS, when was the last time you cleaned your enclosures? Clean those enclosures with a little bit of Windex and take a look at how dirty 
those paper towels are that you use to clean that enclosure. That is just the off gassing of the styrene in the ABS that sticks to pretty much anything that it touches. PLA, PETG, they all have this issue. And I'm actually surprised we don't see anything yet from UL or Underwriter Laboratories about the dangers of 3D printing. Like, I know that we've seen studies on kind of the particulate the 3D printers can get rid of into the air, but... Uh, my general feeling on it is a basic air filter fixes most of these problems. And we do have a DIY HEPA filter that we've been trying out. If you guys want to see a video on that, let me know. It doesn't really involve any 3D printing, but it's stupid cheap to build. And I don't know if you're looking to improve your air quality, maybe in your printer room or really anywhere. It's relatively portable. Uh, it's not a bad idea. And they come in, in like less than a hundred bucks or, you know, cheaper if you get cheaper air filters. But anyways, this is not that big of a deal. If you want to clean it off, you can clean it off. Just a damp paper towel, wipe it down, you'll be fine. But just understand it's going to keep coming back. A great way to kind of contain it is to put a silicone sock on that hot end. That is a volcano style. Just put a sock on it. It is always good. It's cheap insurance. We highly recommend putting socks on printers because the first blob of doom that you have where that silicone sock saves your bacon you're going to remind yourself to get more of those. We can see that actually somebody went through and did the proper thing. So I'm going to read their comments so you guys don't have to. PETG emits acetal de, de, uh, 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 acetaldehyde, sure. Acetaldehyde. When being processed, extruded in your case. It's a low temp volatile gas that is a byproduct of PET and PETG degradation. The name acetaldehyde or AA, as we call it in the industry, is actually used as a sweet aroma enhancer within the wine and juice bottling industry. If a product lacks or you simply want a more sweet smell when you open the container or bottle, you inject this AA. But it's also very sticky and binds with PETG dust created by the printer. By the way, it is considered food safe as an enhancer, but it tastes like absolute doo-doo. So it only works on very sweet tasting products. So don't try. Noted. I wasn't going to, but I feel like the comments are going to say, Florida man, you should try some. Also, every time you drink out of a PET container, you ingest this. It's not harmful at those concentrations. Just tastes horrible in concentration about 7 ppm or more in bottled water. That is super well detailed. That an answer that I would have never thought of. Suspicious Appeal 386. You're going to win comment of the week. We don't do comment of the week, but I'm starting it today and I will definitely forget to do it next week. This is actually way more information than I wanted, but it was the information that I needed and I'm super glad that you told it. Thank you. That's awesome. Next up, a... Uh, bit of a fail montage from one of our discord members by the name of Peter. Peter is dealing with some issues here with one of his bamboo lab printers. As we can see, uh, this is not a 3d print bunny print, or at least it's not 3d print bunny settings. If you guys don't know who 3d print bunny is, we actually just interviewed her at the Sanjay Mortimer Rep Rap Fest 2023. That video came out on Wednesday. We'll card to it so you can take a look. But she is the queen of torture testing printers for some really awesome things. And one of them is making string models like this where something is held up with string. It's super cool. Go check out the video. I think you guys are going to really like it. But this model is having some problems. And we can see he's got this on multiple different models. We can see a good print and then we can see the next print. They don't look great. Certainly there's a problem here. When I looked at it, I pretty much knew what was happening. I think he's got a bad read on his LiDAR sensor. I think he's running an X1 carbon. At least my general understanding is he's running an X1 carbon because the P1P or the P series don't have the ability to measure the same way that the X1 series does. And I have seen this exact issue where my corners look really weird when I get a bad reading on my LiDAR sensor. This can happen if you're running a textured build plate or for some reason the sensor itself or the cameras that read it are dirty. It's a really easy thing to clean and in fact, Bamboo will alert you when it senses that there is an issue, which I like because I'm going to forget to clean it. I know you all are going to forget to clean yours. That's not something I normally have to clean. Cameras on printers. Who freaking knew? But this is, to me, quintessential issues with 
your pressure advance. Because bamboos are bamboos, it is a little tough to adjust that and you certainly cannot do it on the fly. And it's one of my gripes about some of the close sourceness of the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon, but your boy might have gotten his hands on some of that really nice X1 Plus firmware and it may or may not be really freaking awesome and we may or may not be doing a video on it coming very soon. So get subscribed, leave a like, and that's something that you'd like to see. But when you're running a stock machine, you don't have that ability. Now you can run Ellis's print tuning guide and tune it in and add it into your start G code, but then it kind of also takes away the reason that you would get the X1 over the P1 series, which is for all that automation, the stuff that just is click, print, go. That's what people want these machines for. I can see a part that has this problem. I'm gonna go get it so you guys can see it. And yes, for those wondering if my background is real, it is. This is a microphone holder. In fact, I have a microphone here that fits in it. Okay, it's a microphone holder. It's supposed to fit Rode microphones, but I definitely don't have a clone of it. I have had the exact same issue on my Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. So if we look, if you see in those corners, it just doesn't look good. You can see the very obvious seam lines. And in fact, all over this part, you can see little tiny dots where it just didn't do a good job on the LiDAR read. On that back panel, it might be, yeah, there you go. You can see it. It's a little tough to see, but I promise it's there. The problem that I have and why this community firmware is so intriguing to me is that you don't know if you've had a bad LiDAR read until well after the print is rolling. And unless you're watching it, you won't know until the print's done and you've wasted a bunch of time, well, a little bit of time, and a bunch of material. So it would be cool, Bamboo, I know you're listening. If there was a way to compare the LiDAR reading from the previous print to this one to see if they're close enough. If they're close enough, run it. If they're not close enough, maybe we should see if we want to keep this one or use a different one. Just a thought. It can happen. I didn't notice this because it doesn't have any sharp corners until way the frig up here. I didn't notice that this was a problem until I grabbed it off the printer. This is a Polymaker Pop Blue ASA, if you're wondering. But it was a bummer because I needed to make a few more of these. And uh, while technically, if I put a microphone cover over it, it would hide it. It's just not something that I like to see. And in this case, Peter did not like seeing it either. But unfortunately, he's had this issue across multiple prints where we can see here that the actual strings, this is deliberate stringing, by the way, did not get to where they needed to be. It's like the pressure advance is not running the way that you would expect it. This looks to be a much better LiDAR reading, and yet we still have problems. In a case like this, I might be checking my temperatures to make sure it's okay, but certainly when my part starts looking like that on the edges, I am absolutely looking at the LiDAR. Now, if your machine isn't a printer that can do all of that setting and tuning and all of that on its own, you would absolutely want to start running pressure advanced testing. The Ellis print tuning guide is absolutely one of the best out there. And in fact, I believe come with some prints that you can run to validate and tune everything in that will absolutely assist in getting you back to printing with purpose. That's the goal here is to fix these fails, get you back to running with your machines, you know, the way that you want. In a case like this, I might just reprint it. Cause we can see we've had a good print. Looks pretty good, although that's a little bit rough. It's serviceable. It's just a little bit rough. I might look at printing it in a different orientation, but there's really not a good orientation for these parts. Either way, definitely we need to look at some bit of recalibration. Now guys, let me know your thoughts on the fails today. And don't forget, if you do want to submit your own fails to the channel, you can do so by just emailing us or sliding into those DMs on any of the social media accounts. Links to everything are in that description down below. Go support us on Patreon or YouTube channel members or PayPal things and printables coming soon if you do so think that we deserve it and hey you'll get your name in lights like these awesome people right next to me at the five dollar tier and higher thank you for making these videos possible because without you guys we wouldn't be doing it below me will be the entire print fix friday series where you can see some print fails and how we fixed them and next to that will be our smurf 2023 playlist go enjoy it I know we did, and there's going to be a ton of behind-the-scenes footage coming. So if you want to see lots of footage, including hours and hours of POV footage of Amber and I just exploring, go support. 
couple of bucks a month gets you access to all that stuff as we upload it. Anyways, guys, stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Oh, God. Which I need to go this way. The part needs to go this way.